uh, let's say first I will start with some historical overview, then there will be some small intermezzo of mice and elephants, and then I will focus on the main part of the talk. And there will be actually also physics inside, and this will be story about the ordinary compound. And at the end, I will conclude with a very simple message. And actually, now I spoiled it to you, so now now you know how all the uh, my whole my whole talk will end. But uh, let's start with the history of physics. As you probably know, every every scientific talk starts with some famous uh, photos of uh, famous Nobelists, which are in black and white. And I, I will actually do the same. And we will start with a, with a picture of Philip von Jolly. And this guy was a teacher of Max Planck. He was teaching in Munich. And Max Planck was asking him what should uh, he, he study now. And he, he basically advised him, well, definitely not go to physics because physics is already discovered and there is nothing uh, interesting anymore. But actually, he did not listen to him. Well, maybe luckily for us, uh, especially, and together with some other quite clever guys like Einstein and uh, Schrodinger here, they basically created a world of, uh, like, a wonderful world of quantum mechanics. And basically everything is hidden in this uh, equation. Uh, but this equation uh, is a tricky, as you know, and you uh, for sure learn it uh, in the lectures at university. Schrodinger equation can be exactly solved only for atom only for a system with maximal one electron. And that's a problem because like in reality, we are, or I am experimental physicist and uh, we want to solve the problems with more electrons. So, but then came some clever guys actually just a year later born together with uh, his friend Oppenheimer. They created the idea that we can uh, solve it separately for, for nuclei, which are quite heavy and uh, inside the atom. And then we will solve it separately for electrons. And then, then we will put everything together. So this was done almost, um, almost 100 years ago. And now actually today I'm here and I want to convince you in this talk that uh, it's not a good idea always to do it. Uh, it's some simplification, but actually we have now quite powerful computers. Uh, Born and Oppenheimer did not have any computers, of course. And so now maybe it's a time to start really calculating uh, systems correctly and don't using some, uh, don't, uh, without using some approximations. So that's some introduction to my talk. And now was this uh, small intermezzo. Uh, it has nothing to do with the famous novel of uh, John Steinbeck. We will just focus of, uh, on a regular elephant and, and the mice. So this is it. Uh, the, 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 the elephant uh, is here. And now uh, it's a question, what's the weight of this, uh, this elephant? And uh, actually, you can't tell me that because uh, weights of the elephant is not constant in time. So if you want to know that, I need to specify you, you time, which means like the age of the elephant. So now I will tell you this elephant is eight years old. And if we know it, we can search some literature. And there is a wonderful study uh, which uh, where some clever guys, which are not physicists at all, but they, they produce this, this clever Bigger, and this is basically the dependence of the weight of the elephant on its age. And if you know, okay, it's a eight years old elephant and it's a, it's a man, then we can know, okay, that its exact weight is uh, 1,130 kilograms. So that's elephant. And now let's focus on the mice. This is a regular mice. Like, basically, it's a little bit bigger mouse. It's a gaming mouse, which probably all of you know. And the weight of this is 0.3 kilos. So why I am telling you this? Well, the elephant is heavy, right? And the, the, the computer mouse is quite, quite light. And if they will be interacting together and we want to measure this interaction, this will be very difficult. Actually, imagine that you want to have some device and on this device, you want to weigh the elephant and on the same device, you want to, to weigh the mouse. And this will be quite impossible to do with some reasonable precision. And actually, if we look to, to the electrons, uh, and the electrons are very, uh, they are very, very light. Uh, and if we look to the atomic nuclei, so the, the, the mass of the proton and neutron together is, is, is roughly 3,000 um, kilos uh, times 10 to minus 30. So you see 
that the, the ratio between the nuclease and the electrons is the exactly or very similar to this uh, elephant and this mouse. And now it's a question how we want to measure the interaction. And as I said, it's very difficult task. It, if you have not, let's say, the correct ruler, you will not be able to measure it precisely. And actually we need a very precise measurement because some effects which I will show later are very, very weak. So imagine if you have like wrong ruler, for example, and where you want to measure the size of the football field and you will use a regular, regular ruler which you have on your desk. And then you can imagine that uh, the first, it will take ages. So it will be very time consuming to do it. And the second, then the precision of the measurement of the whole uh, football field will be pretty, uh, pretty bad. And actually, this is the same, for example, if you want to use a synchrotron uh, to measure together uh, the uh, motion of atomic nuclei, which are some lattice vibrations, let's say phonons, and you want to measure it together uh, with some uh, electron uh, or magnetic interactions in the material, you will be able to do it, but your precision will be either very, very small or you need to use more machines, uh, more devices together. But actually, there is one method uh, and there is one particle who can measure both together. And this is a neutron. And this is actually the whole idea of my talk that neutron is very unique particle because neutron has a quite uh, big mass. And this is comparable with the mass of the atomic nuclei. Well, of course, because the atomic nuclei is from neutrons as well. So it's interacting. We had a strong interaction with the atomic nuclei. But in addition, neutron has a spin a neutron is using the spin. Is it the same neutron as it's interacting with, uh, with the atomic nuclei, is interacting with electrons via its spin. And therefore we can use neutrons to really measure interaction, like directly in one measurement, we will be able to see a crosstalk between these two phenomena. So, and now I will really come to the physics. So the, the main part now uh, is starting now and I will tell you the story of the ordinary compound. At the beginning, I want to introduce you our team. I'm currently working in Charles University in Prague in the group of uh, Pavel Jaworski and uh, with my colleague Milan Klitspera who is doing experiments and Dominic Legut who is doing uh, theory. We are trying to discover more of this magnetoelectric interaction, but uh, main part and majority of the measurements actually were done uh, previously when I was uh, part of the team in Forschungszentrum Jülich in the outstation in Garching, and I was working in the team of Astrid Schneidewind and together with Ben Chong Liu. Uh, she's a theoretician and she basically uh, wrote the whole theory of uh, which I will be show, uh, showing to you later. Uh, I was cooperating with the group of Christian Fliederer, so the single crystals which we use for measurement were grown by Christian Franz. And I also thank all the local contacts uh, like Oleg Sobolev and also people from ILL uh, here and uh, also the ISIS uh, who helped me uh, a lot with the calculations of crystalline electric field. And we will start with the crystalline electric field, maybe a small introduction for all who are not uh, very familiar with the topic. If you will imagine the free cerium three plus ion, like free means that there is nothing around it, uh, it will, uh, its states uh, will be generated. So it will be a six fold degenerated term and all these wave functions, as you can see here, will have the same energy and they will be all, let's say on the same, they will be equally uh, populated. But if you will put the cerium three plus ion into some environment, let's say I will put it to the cubic environment, uh, this degeneracy will split and I will have now like one doublet and one quadruplet. And this is uh, based on the, the symmetry of the compound. I will put it to, if I will lower the symmetry, for example, in the tetragonal symmetry, uh, these states will further split and we will have uh, together uh, like three states. It will be three doublets. One of them will be, will have the lowest energy. So it will be the ground state. And then it will be first and second excited uh, doublet. 
So this will happen in the tetragonal symmetry. And this was all known and people were measuring it like 40 years ago and on many compounds. And one of this was a cerium aluminum two. And uh, in cerium aluminum two, this is a cubic compound. So if you look here to this cheat sheet, you will see, ah, this is a cubic compound. There is a cerium crystal and electric field should have two levels, one ground state and one excited state. If you will put this to the neutron beam, you should be able to detect uh, one excitation from the ground state to the first excited state. So the simple, very simple system, and you should be able to see just one magnetic peak. And it was done, it was measured, and well, look at this chart here. There are like two peaks. So this is not consistent with this theory, and then people were puzzled. And a few years later came Talmayer and Fulde, and they created the theory of vibronic bound state. And what this this theory saying? Well, they figured out there is a there are phonons and what are phonons are lattice vibrations. So, so the atoms, all atomic nuclei are vibrating in the atom and they, they are moving uh, through, uh, basically there are some waves which we can then detect. And there is a very high density of this phonon state on exactly the same level as should be lying this uh, quadruplet. So if you will put this high density of phonon states, and this will have the same symmetry as crystal electric field, which actually happens, then they will hybridize together. And then they will create some additional states. And because of the cubic symmetry together, we will have them basically four different states. Well, we will not be able to detect the transition from this doublet to this uh, second uh, excited doublet because there is just quadrupolar interaction in between them. So on the neutrons, uh, we are seeing just these two uh, levels here, and this is exactly how theory predicts it. And the same was measured in few other compounds, uh, not many. And one of them is recently uh, compound cerium copper aluminum three. And this is a tetragonal compound. So again, look at this cheat sheet here. Because it's tetragonal, there should be together two levels if you are, uh, if you are at the base temperature. Uh, or very low in temperature. So there should be excitations from the ground state to the first excited level and to the second excited level. But again, what was seen by Roja in his uh, time of flight experiment, there was a one level here, second level here, and third level here. And again, it was explained by the high density of phonon state is splitting the state to additional uh, doublets. So together we have four doublets in our system. And this is, of course, changing properties of the whole material. But it seems very rare, and people were looking for other compounds, and one like candidate was cerium gold aluminum-3, and this is basically the same structure as previously mentioned, cerium copper aluminum-3. It's the same symmetry, but uh, instead of the copper, there are the gold particles, uh, gold elements is here. And here you see the Berlin zone, and we will use the, the image of the Berlin zone later. Uh, actually, all the measurements, uh, which I will show you later, were done above the TN. So we are not now focusing on, on the ground state of the material and its magnetic properties because the compound is ordering, but this is not important now. And when I came to this compound, basically almost everything was already measured. Uh, magnetic structure was known. Bulk properties were known, and uh, Adroja and his group also measured the time of flight uh, excitation spectrum of this compound. And they detected just uh, one excitation here and second excitation here on 25 MeV. And so they conclude, or 24 MeV, that there are two crystalline electric field levels and there is no additional coupling with the phonons or there is no breaking of this Born-Oppenheimer approximation. So just remember these uh, values and what we did, basically Christian Franz grown a very nice and large single crystal of these compounds. And this is a big uh, difference from the previous measurement because previously Adroja used the powder and they measured the time of flight. So everything, uh, all the information from the reciprocal space were averaged. So you can't see the details, but we have the large single crystal and we used it on the triple axis neutron spectrometers. One is Panda and second is Puma. Panda, well, you know, Panda is very slow and lazy animal and therefore it's using slow and lazy neutrons. So this is a cold triple axis spectrometer. 
And then we needed to go a little bit higher in energy. So we moved to Puma, which is nearby. Both these instruments are in uh, MLZ uh, Garching neutron facility. And then Puma, Puma, you know, Puma is very fast animal. So there are thermal neutrons and these are very good to look for the phonons and the higher excitations in your material. And this is our result. And now I will spend a couple of minutes explaining you this image. Uh, so let's, uh, let's look what is here. As you remember uh, from the previous part, uh, actually there should be a crystalline electric field at 5 MeV, which was also detected by Aldroja, which is here. But in addition, we have found something else, which is, uh, which is here, which was uh, at uh, 8 MeV almost. And well, let's look uh, if it has magnetic origin. If you want to see the magnetic origin, you are normally looking first for the Q dependence. And I look in the Q, it's going down as a cerium three plus form factor. So this should be magnetic. Then we look for the temperature dependence. And yes, with a higher temperature, the intensity is going down. So it seems it's really not phononic and it has a magnetic origin in this bound state. But well, it's, it has not same intensity on the all Q points. So here in this small chart is a comparison of the intensity at the M point, which is the border of the brilliant zone here, and the gamma point, which is in the middle of the brilliant zone here. So the intensity is different, but uh, it's still there. So it's really flat excitation, which exists everywhere. And finally, we solved the puzzle by uh, using polarized neutrons. So this is the result uh, from, from Grenoble, from polarized experiment. And you can see that these excitations are really magnetic. So this is a final proof uh, that there is additional excitations, which was not seen on time of light because they basically averaged everything. And now look to the right chart of our plot. And this is a wonderful color plot and you see the Transverse acoustic phonon is here and the crystalline electric phonon is here and they are basically just existing on the same place. Here is addition of these excitations. So there is nothing weird and nothing interesting in, in this picture. But if you will see to the other side and the other side is basically along the, the C axis and here along the C axis, we have the same symmetry of the crystalline electric fields and uh, these transverse phonons. And then what you can see here in this place, uh, if you will focus in the middle, there is a direct anti-crossing between these two phenomena. So this is it. And this is it, which can be detected only because there are neutrons and neutrons can really see in one measurement, the repulsion of the crystalline electric field mode and the transverse acoustic phonon. And there is really a place where is no intensity in the middle and we have resolved it pretty well. We then looked to the theory and I found the theory which was predicted uh, like a long time ago, almost 40 years ago by Aksenov. Aksenov actually is still in physics. He's now head of uh, Russian Academy of Science. And he wrote a paper and no, almost no one cited it. And here uh, he predicted this anti-crossing for praseodium nickel five. Uh, and actually, he was not able to measure it because uh, of bad resolution of the spectrometer, but we did the same and then we compared our result with his result and we were able to see also the coupling constant and how big is the magnetoelastic coupling in our materials. So let me conclude and summarize the results. So we had a very simple and let's say really ordinary compound. Everything was measured and normally you will not get any more beam time because everyone will say, oh, this is already done. It's not interesting, but we did the measurement again, but we used a single crystal. And secondly, we used it on triple axis machine. Nowadays, you can also do the same on time of flight, but you need to use the single crystalline mode. And we figured out and find the new, two new stuff, which was not foreseen before. And this exists in all, also other materials. So just quickly go through the similar thing was detected in a, in a pyrochlores by the group of uh, the Rumini in PSI. And they, they, they seen the same effect in neptunium dioxide in the group of Roberto Cacciufo in Karlsruhe. Also in Russian Academy of Science, they see uh, the similar behavior in multiferroic rare borates. And finally, is this in heavy fermion compounds. So uh, together, if you look, you have very different group of compounds and they have one thing in common. It's magnetoelastic coupling and this magnetoelastic coupling, 
me say that they are really general property of solid state physics. Sometimes they are more pronounced, sometimes they are less pronounced, but they are there and we should not ignore them. But actually we don't have theory for it. And this is just some prediction to the future. Uh, maybe there will be theory. I like a lot a concept of Professor Michel Emeshko. He is now a professor in uh, uh, nearby the Vienna. He's a very successful young uh, physicist. And his concept is basically he's calculating together, putting together a uh, multi orbital atom like the electrons uh, and uh, orbital moment of electrons. And he is uh, putting it together with, with the phonon field. But this is a little bit different approach uh, from the Talmayer approach, which uh, Talmayer did this uh, 30 years ago. But if you look to the calculations, which was done by in cooperation with Johann Menting, uh, they basically used this uh, Angulon theory of Lemeshko to the condensed uh, matter uh, single crystal uh, material. And you see there is really this delta function, and this is this additional state predicted by Talmayer, but in addition, there is some continuum, which was not yet experimentally observed, but maybe, maybe you will be able to see it. And I think neutrons are the only way uh, how you can detect this continuum. And because it's Friday, and maybe a lot of you is on Twitter, uh, I putting a hashtag follow Friday and follow Professor Lemeshko. Other of Mechtes do Deutsch sprechen, dort ist ein andere Lemeshko Twitter account on the system in Deutsch. And uh, with this, let me summarize my talk. As uh, I said at the beginning, neutrons are great and it's because of their spin and because of their mask. And there are three uh, take home messages from my talk. Well, we know now that it is not safe to use Born Oppenheimer approximation and definitely we need some new theories and new software. Second point, always use and measure everything on the single crystal if it's possible and use always triplexes or time of light and ideally polarized. And there should be actually many uh, polarized uh, or several new polarized time of flight machines in the future. So there will be boom of these magnetoelectric effects in the future. And at the end, as I, I hope I convince you that neutrons are the only probe to detect uh, interaction between uh, the phonons and electrons together. If you are interested more in details, uh, everything uh, what I have shown you is published in this uh, paper here. Data are published. I'm really uh, some, I'm really open data enthusiast. And uh, so all the scripts, all the data are open for everyone. They are published on Fixture platform and the theory is published in this third uh, paper here by, by Beijing Liu. And with this, I really thank you for your attention. <laughs>